Our scripture reading today is Colossians chapter 4. This will be the text from which Dan preaches momentarily. Chapter 4, verses 7 to the end of the chapter. So as to all my affairs, Tychicus, our beloved brother and faithful servant and fellow bondservant in the Lord, will bring you information. For I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of your number, they will inform you about the whole situation here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, sends you his greetings, and also Barnabas' cousin Mark, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And also Jesus, who is called Justice. These are the only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are from the circumcision. And they have proved to be an encouragement to me. Epaphras, who is one of your number, a bond slave of Jesus Christ, sends you his greetings, always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers, that you may stand perfect and fully assured in all the will of God. For I testify for him that he has a deep concern for you and for those who are in Laodicea and Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, sends you his greetings, and also Demas. Greet the brethren who are in Laodicea and also Nympha and the church that is in her house. When this letter is read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. And you, for your part, read my letter that is coming from Laodicea. Say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my imprisonment. Grace be with you. Father in heaven, it is because of the cross of Jesus that we can come before your throne of grace and that we can stand united in Christ as your children, knit into a family for your purposes. And I pray that you would shape us in those things, that you would strengthen our hope, increase our faith and love, because we've understood how you've loved us in Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. So when you read through books of the Bible on your own, What do you do with closings of letters like this where it's just a list of names? Our temptation is often just to gloss over them. I mean, isn't the real content over? And here is to focus on these people that 2,000 years ago, names you don't really know, giving these greetings and commendations. Sometimes we feel it's like we're at the movie theater. The movie's over and the credits are rolling and it's just time to move on. But that type of attitude, that temptation can make us think, well, this isn't really relevant. But if we take some time and reflect on what's going on here, what we find is this isn't just a list of names of people. But if we step back and look, we see a beautiful tapestry of what God is doing in the lives of such a diverse group of people. We see an illustration of the transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ an outworking of of the truth that Paul's been writing about through this whole epistle. I don't know if you ever think about it, but some of the most significant truths, the most significant realities in life are realities we can't see. Think of things like the the Trinity or the Atonement or or love. Sometimes we use the example of, of wind to help us understand it. We can't see wind in itself, but we can see the effects when it blows You can see the the dust churn up, or you can hear the rustle when it goes through leaves on the trees. Love, something that's very powerful. It drives us. Our loves are what motivate us in life, and, and we feel love, and it shapes us in so many ways, and we can try and express it in words and deeds. But in itself, we... We can't see it. It's something that goes on in the inner person, but it works out in how we deal with others and live our life. Well, the gospel is something we can't see either. We can't see, as we said, the atonement. We can't see forgiveness. We can't yet see the new creation. It can be proclaimed and spoken about. In fact, that's what the gospel is. The gospel is good news. It's a proclamation of what God is doing and has done in Christ and what he promises. But the Bible says that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. 
Paul has been encouraging the Colossians in the gospel and in their life in Christ. Going back to the beginning of Colossians chapter 1, even Paul's talking about how they heard the word of truth, the gospel. And it's bearing fruit increasingly. It had effects that could be seen in the lives of those who embraced it. And when it takes root in the lives of people, it's transforming. Not just individually, but together as well. It joins people together in a a common life, common purpose. People who otherwise would have no connection, no commonalities, they're joined together in this gospel. And so that's what we want to look at today. We want to look at some of this tapestry and the outworkings of gospel fellowship, of participation in the gospel. We're going to look at some of the threads in this tapestry, the first being a shared ministry in diverse unity and costly reward, how we share in the service of our Lord and the purpose, how in the diversity that we have, we're all unified in a common goal towards the gospel. And there is a cost to serving this way, but there is a reward in it for us that's eternal and everlasting. And and we need to think about how we have embraced Christ and the gospel, how we live it out in our own church, our own community, and how the gospel is to lift us out of our own individualistic perspective that is so prevalent in our culture, that's so shaping, that it even shapes our religion to be self-focused. But gospel fellowship is to be about having Christ and his, his truth, his promises, shape our lives and our hope. And it's to work out in what we see and speak and do. First, we're going to look at shared ministry. This is just one shade of thread in the tapestry of gospel fellowship. And as Paul goes through this list of closing greetings, what emerges is the idea that there's many others at work in the gospel with Paul. Look at the language in this passage, verse 7. We have this fellow bond servant with Tychicus, a slave of Christ, seeing him as his master. We have a fellow prisoner in verse 10 with Aristarchus, here even bound in chains with Paul. We have verse 11, fellow workers, fellow, fellow, fellow. It's not Paul going it alone. Sometimes we have this notion of Paul, the great apostle, as this lone pioneer. But this is not a picture of a one-man show. It's not Paul's heart. He's always working with other people. That's his desire. Even the time that he's briefly alone in Athens, he, he, he longs to be with others. And in this letter here, we, we see some of the people who have stood by him. They've actually strengthened him in the ministry and helped it to be what it was. And he considers them brothers and sisters because of the gospel. We see that term often in scriptures and even in this passage, this term brethren, or brothers and sisters. The fascinating thing that those who are one in Christ, they're, they're closer than family. I mean, think of Jesus when he's, when he's talking to people and his, his mother and brothers, sisters, they come around and, and Jesus says, who's my real family? Who are my brothers, mothers, and sisters? It's those who do the will of my father. And that's tighter than even blood. We have this family, and and they are fellows in ministry of the gospel, all together, all wanting to see Christ exalted, all having trusted in his promises and his hope. It's fascinating. They, They understand, of course, this kinship even across the miles. They're sending greetings from where Paul's in prison to these far off places. These people just say, say hello from me as well. We share the same faith, the same Lord. Even this sharing nearby letters, you see that there's this exchange of letters between these two cities. Have them read your letter, read my letter to them. It assumes that the encouragement to the Colossians isn't just for them, but it's for the others too. It's still the case. God's word to them is still God's word for us. 
and as they work together, and when we work together, serve together, the message is actually bolstered by what is seen in our lives, in our service. Our unity is enhanced. That's how it should be in the church. We often have this notion that leadership is the one who does the ministry. Churches go out and they they hire a new minister and they have a a list of things that they should do to be serving. And and that's not really the biblical picture. The the word for minister, of course, is the word for servant, which is the word for deacon. We see that in verse 7 there. But it's not just used for the office of deacon. It's used for someone who ministers, who serves others. Ministry is what Christians do. Pastors have the job of equipping the saints for the work of ministry. That's what it says in Ephesians 4. And we're to have unity in this ministry. So the, the pastors, it says, okay, we're, we're, we're going to gird you with truth. So we're not blown around by all sorts of false teaching and other doctrine. No, we all participate in the one truth, the one spirit, the one body, one gospel, and we have fellowship in that. When we came up here, the church was already named And I like that it has the term fellowship in it. Fellowship isn't what you do when you just sit across from someone over coffee and chat about the weather. Fellowship is a joint participation in a common purpose. It's being involved together in the Lord's work. It's serving the Lord in the gospel. And in the church, if we participate in the gospel, everyone's working together, we're, we're on game, then we all have the same goal. I, I use that phrase, on game. I was reading this book that's talking about participating in the gospel together, and it's a mindset, a mindset that we're, we're on this purpose. We're not just being fragmented on our own agendas. And it gives an example of this person who was on an airplane flying somewhere, and they had the opportunity to share Christ with the person next to them. I don't remember all the details, but... This Christian invited the non-Christian to an event, a wedding, I believe it was, at the church. And she knew that her fellow workers would be on game to adorn the gospel, to be able to speak truth. And, and, and maybe people's lifestyles don't add up, but other people who are among them could connect with them and, and get an opportunity to adorn Christ and proclaim the gospel in those ways. So it means to be on game. We come together, not just to hear, but to encourage each other, to to be a testimony to who Christ is. And so, it's not just about the pastor. It's not just someone with the gift of evangelism, but it's the whole church speaking about Jesus and living with him at the center of our lives. Isn't he the head of the church? Remember back in Colossians 1.18, he's the head of the body of the church. That means he dictates... Our purpose, what is our our body about? What's this organization about? Christ says. And he's left us here to be about the gospel, about exalting who God is. Are we willing to put ourselves under him? We share in our submission to him as well. We willingly put ourselves under him. So chapter 3, verse 17, whatever you do, You do it in the name of the Lord. That's submission. We're doing it for his sake, his name. And I don't know if you understand this, but if we're going to have a proper health and unity and growth of the church, it depends on us all being connected to this common purpose and hope. Doesn't it? Isn't that what we're supposed to be together about? Unified together, this common purpose of the gospel. I say hope as well because our our shared life of faith and love is is undergirded by the hope of the gospel. Sometimes we think the gospel is just the forgiveness of sins, but it's also the hope of glory. If you're looking back again in Colossians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, that's what Paul talks about. He talks about our faith and our love is because of the hope. The hope that's in the gospel. We understand that this life is not all there is, and it changes how we look at everything. 
Faith is, is an outworking of hope. Hope is actually the future aspect of faith. We have a certainty of what's coming before us, and it, it changes that we trust that's coming, so we trust them in all of life. And it works out because he's loved us that we can love others, and it flows out of our life. And that gospel of hope, it calls all sorts of people into Christ's church. So we look at our next point on diverse unity, this diversity we have in the body. Now, as we're looking at a letter again, it was typical in this era that letters would include closing greetings. When Paul was writing to a church he hadn't visited, like Colossae in Romans, the, the list of folks is typically larger than in churches that he knew well. So what do greetings do? They actually serve to make a connection with those people. Here's people who you know that I know. And they're with me, and we're together in these things. And, and we want to send those greetings. These are people who they had some mutual connection with. And it gave an opportunity for those with Paul to, to pass on their care as well. Do you ever go on a, on a trip somewhere, and you're visiting some distant family, and, and when you go and when you come back, they say, oh, say hello to your so-and-so, your cousin for me. And, and it shows some kind of connection when they do that, Right? They could have just called them themselves, but they tell you, make sure you say hi to so-and-so. It's a way of showing that care. As we said earlier, all all Christians have a common connection in Christ, but these are likely people that they knew specifically, something about or even knew personally. And what we see here is quite a mixed group. It's very diverse. We have Romans and Greeks and Jews, a runaway slave, past failures, a, a woman, a doctor, all these different diverse people, diverse backgrounds, they're joined together for the cause of Christ. What do we have here? We have this picture that the gospel has spanned, it's transcended natural boundaries and bonds, it's, it's overcome social barriers ethnic barriers, economic barriers, status barriers, things which were very separating, particularly in those times. Let's look at some of these. First, you have these two gentlemen, Tychicus and Onesimus, in verses 7 to 9. These guys are the letter carriers, but they're, they're more than letter carriers. They know the details. They also have the same vision. And they took this letter, as we said, probably with the letter to the Ephesians and the letter to Philemon from Paul to their destinations. And these two, Paul talks about them basically on the same level as beloved brothers. You see that? Now we might think, okay, no big deal. But this would be quite astonishing in light that Onesimus was a slave. A runaway slave at that, a criminal. He had ran away from Philemon broke away from that bound, and somehow he encountered Paul while Paul was imprisoned. He was converted. He was saving faith in Christ through Paul's ministry. The criminal still by Roman law. But Paul says now that he's a faithful and trusted associate of his. In the letter to Philemon, he tells Philemon, his master, receive him back as a brother, that term brother again, because Philemon was a believer too. Radical in that day. And then you have Mark, also known as John Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. This is the same Mark who had somewhat of a checkered past, checkered career in Paul's early missionary labors. About 10 to 12 years before this, Mark had abandoned Paul and Barnabas while they were on the first missionary journey. Caused this huge rift between Paul and Barnabas because Paul didn't want to take him with him again. And here, you have just this simple commendation. Welcome him. Why is it necessary to say that? Maybe they've heard about his desertion. Paul says, welcome him. The mention here and, and also in Philemon and, and particularly in Second Timothy 4 shows that 
Mark eventually was brought back on track. We have here a person who's been restored. It's interesting you see how Peter talks about him as well. In 1 Peter 5, Peter mentions Mark favorably. He's one of Peter's companions now. He calls him my son. The gospel, of course, spans age groups as well. Think of how the gospel might have worked out in that situation. You have a guy like Mark who quit. And he met Peter who also quit. Peter knew what it meant to quit and to be restored. So John Mark is restored to usefulness. Paul says of him in 2 Timothy 4, at the end of Paul's life, get Mark, bring him with you, for he is very useful to me for ministry. One who was mistrusted. One who was a disappointment. He's now in close fellowship and he's useful with Paul. He actually wrote one of the Gospels. Haven't we all been a disappointment? Haven't we stumbled in many ways? Because of the gospel, the failure we have doesn't need to be the last word, does it? See, the gospel, it not only speaks of forgiveness, it speaks of change. We don't have to remain as we once were. And what Christ did on the cross, he removed our sins from us, past, present, and future. And he wants us to walk in that grace and and find renewal and hope and and, and change and make it our aim to be different than it was. So because of the gospel, we can look back on our failures and say, look at the grace I've received. We can also say, look at what God has done in my life as he's changed us. And if you're in failure now, you're going to find hope. And you can know what God can do in your life. That's bigger than just sitting together. It's having a common unity in the grace we've received that should melt away boasting and comparison one with another. That should help us to point one another to who our real Savior is. This gospel also spans ethnic barriers. The most significant divides through the ages, even then, are ethnic divides. Let's wreak havoc among nations and peoples that divide in war and make distinctions because of ethnicity. This was particularly true of Jews and Gentiles with a, a hard past, And here in verse 11, summarizing what comes before, talking about these three gentlemen are Aristarchus, Mark, and and Justice Jesus. Jesus was a popular name, so we're on a justice with it to clarify. And he says these guys are Jews. They're fellow workers with Paul in the gospel, and apparently the only Jews, it seems, that would work with them at that point. You see, there was such a divide between Jews and Gentiles that, that, that the Jews couldn't see that the Gentiles could be included in the people of God as Gentiles. The gospel came to break that down, but but here are people who are being alienated from their, their own people to be with Paul. And here we have these three Jews with Paul who are sending greetings to a Gentile church, largely. Right after that, Paul writes about three Gentiles are with him who are also sending greetings. We have Epaphras, Luke, and Demas. These are co-workers too. And they, they seem to all be with Paul at some level where he's imprisoned. They're together in the gospel work. And there they are, apparently being able to rub shoulders without things exploding. No, no because of the gospel, they embrace each other as brothers in Christ. They send greetings to this Gentile church as brothers from brothers. It's not just tolerating one another. It's a care and concern 
Paul didn't make the direct connection here, but this shows just what he was talking about earlier in the letter in chapter 3, verse 11. He says, in Christ, there's, there's no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, and slave and free. Think about Onesimus again, but Christ is all and in all. This tension is spelled out more carefully even in Ephesians, which was also carried by the two letter carriers where Paul talks about that Christ has come and he's broken down the dividing wall, the hostility between these peoples, the law of the commandments, that he might create for himself one new man. And so he's making peace. He's reconciling us both to God in one body through the cross, killing hostility. May it never be that the people of Christ show that kind of disdain for anyone else when we're all joined to Christ. Paul says we're fellow citizens. Gentiles are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. We're part of the family of God together. We're fellow heirs in Christ. Ethnic barriers are transcended by the gospel. Let's not forget about class distinctions and those barriers. Here we have Luke, the physician. He's become a regular companion of Paul, we learn through Acts and the other epistles. And generally we should understand that a doctor has a different status than a runaway slave and a criminal like Onesimus. They're brothers and sisters as well. There's gender diversity. Here's Nymphia, verse 15, a woman apparently who has some means. She opens up her home for the church to meet in and uses her resources to support the gospel community and, and work. We see different roles, like different roles in the body metaphor. Remember uh, 1 Corinthians 12, you have a body, there's arms, heads, all these different functions in a body, but they're one body, just like in the church. There's, there's different functions in the body. So we have some who provide resources, some who bring letters and news, some who encourage, some with, with a pastor's heart and pastoral care, like Epaphras, verse 13. He's the one who founded the church, perhaps even in prison with Paul now, and, and he works hard for them. He's got a burden for them. Archippus, apparently he has some specific ministry charge that he labors in 2, verse 17. And what binds this diverse group of people together? One thing, the bond of Christ through the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the power to create community that spans all sorts of barriers and still have unity. This portrait we have here is a beautiful portrayal of the power of the gospel, particularly seen when you have relationships that they can't really be explained except for the gospel. It's so sweet when you, you see that diversity come together. I remember I went on a short-term trip to the Ukraine. There's people with a very different background, very different language, could hardly speak some of them going through a translator, but there was this unity that we had. They were brothers and sisters in Christ as we share our stories of faith in Christ and what the Lord's doing in our lives. We we, we find a harmony. There's this unity across all this diversity that speaks differently. It speaks more loudly than a group of people who just come from the same demographics and are together who have similar life experiences. Within a church, you could have all sorts of many close-knit groups. You can have a singles group. You can have newly married groups. You can have a group that knits, a group that hunts, a group that likes a certain sporting event, a group that homeschools, groups that share similar felt needs or dietary restrictions or social position, all sorts of different types of things. And there's nothing wrong with wanting to be with people with similar life experience, Right? But those kind of groups can exist without the gospel. There can be a different foundation. But the gospel is to span these things, to reach out to those who aren't like us and and join us in something that's at the core of who we are. Jesus, you remember he taught on the Sermon on the Mount, if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Implication, 
There's a love that the gospel feels that extends beyond just those who love us or even like-minded. It reaches out to draw in. When we're united together in love and service and relationships that have little in common except for Christ and the gospel, then the presence and power of Christ is set on magnificent display. It's an evidence of Christ's transforming power that people would say, how is it that a slave is now a brother to his master? How is it that one of such a failure and disappointment can be so useful? How is it that people so different love one another from the heart? Because Christ transforms every single person he touches. And it is glorious when we see that. We see the outworking of the gospel. We know there's a reality underneath that's bigger than just superficial things. We might well ask ourselves, has the love of Christ so shaped me? So much that I'm willing to go beyond my comfort zone to to cultivate relationships that wouldn't be possible apart from the gospel? You know, sometimes we, we don't always know how to interact with others, people who are different from us, even, even here in the church building. But if we come here, even into this building, isn't it reasonable to consider that, that we're coming because we have some acknowledgement of, of the God who's there? Maybe, maybe not, but it's reasonable to, to talk about spiritual things. What's your spiritual background, the things of God, the gospel? Maybe even offer to read the Bible together. You don't have to find out just what their interests are. That's fine. But what are we on about? Can people tell what we're on about here by observing how we interact with one another and how we speak to one another? What sets our values, our priorities, our goals? Will you aspire to connect with people who aren't like you? Whether it be different age or ethnicity or status, occupation, and see what God might do. It's just a, a blessed fellowship when you can actually connect with someone on that level. Whether we do it well or not, it's always pleasing when we strive to be exalting the Son and make it our aim to be pleasing to the Lord. But it could be costly too. And so we look at our last point there on costly reward. We come to the last verse in the letter, verse 18. And it's typical, again, with a letter to come with some kind of grace wish. Paul began the letter by asking for grace to be upon the Colossians in chapter 1, verse 2. And it's fitting that he concludes with a similar wish. It's fitting because that's our need. If we're going to continue to to grow in faith, and, and particularly in the face of false teaching that, that was there and is all around us as well. We need God's grace to endure. We need God's grace to keep us on his purposes and, and away from the deceitful ways that are around us. And so Paul gives this closing greeting and that he writes in his own hand, it says. Letters were often dictated to someone else who could write neatly and small to preserve the valuable papyrus. And so the practice of adding a brief handwritten note at the end was common. It's kind of like when we have printed papers now, we actually sign our name with ink and maybe write a little note in it to show that this is really from us. But what's fascinating in this particular closing is that Paul weaves in this little phrase, remember my chains, remember my imprisonment, People speculate on why that particular phrase, maybe it's to remind them to pray. I don't think it's to pray that he gets out because he's already talked about in Philippians how his imprisonment turned out for the advance of the gospel and that he rejoices and that's what he, he was on about. So maybe remembering his chains is a testimony of how the gospel still works out in spite of hardship. But whatever the reason is, 
it shows that the work of the gospel can be costly. Paul's gospel work cost him his freedom. It wasn't really anything new. When Paul set out to follow Christ, he had given up so many opportunities for ease and comfort and security. Remember, he had been a Pharisee. He was elevated above his peers. He he had a, a good lineage and heritage and education and schooling, all the things that would have set him up with a comfortable career, with prestige and status, honor. And he gave it up for the message of the cross. And it brought opposition and that's an understatement. You, you look at the hardships he went through, the shipwrecks, the beatings, the, the imprisonments he suffered, and yet he could call it momentary light afflictions compared to the surpassing the weight of glory that he would have in heaven. He had gain on the other side, but it cost him in this life. It cost us too. It cost us relationships, jobs. Comfort, security, it's like Paul. You see, the, the effects of the gospel don't just end with the forgiveness of our sins. But it can lead to some very disruptive implications. Paul understood that. He looks back on his giving everything up in Philippians chapter 3. He looks back at all his upbringing and status and education and He says, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. It's like I suffered the loss of all things. I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Not earning it, but he wanted to attain to the resurrection What do we see? What do we learn from Paul here? But there was a sacrifice that is a gain. There's a giving up that is ultimately not a loss. There's a cost. But in the final accounting, he comes out way ahead. I I, I think one of our biggest struggles is, is we don't count things all a loss. We want to hold on to our things and have Christ. And then when we actually lose those things, we're devastated. But if we count it for loss, when when we have the value of Christ, when I actually come to lose those things, I'm not as devastated. I'm not a shipwrecked. I'm not like a a ship without a rudder because I have Christ. And it can cost. Our effort is a cost. Serving Christ in the gospel, getting involved with people, serving them, it, it can draw your heart in. It's pain something. Look at Epaphras again. He's the founder of this church. and He's called the slave like others with a, with a ministry heart. Even the term slave itself implies a cost, doesn't it? You're, you're bound to something else. Verse 12. Epaphras, he's always laboring earnestly for you. In his prayers, there's this strenuous, this consistent intervention on behalf of the Colossians, but especially in light of, of the danger posed by false teachers. It's, it's probably when he went to Paul to tell him about these things. He, he has a deep concern. And, and with, when those who you minister to are, are, are faced with threats to their spiritual well-being, you have a burden for them. We devote energy and prayer upholding the truth of the gospel, the hope of the gospel, trying to bring it to bear on their souls. It's a burden when people get pulled away and and taken away from that hope and and you want to see them in the same joy that you have and that you're battling for. Verse 12, he longs for them to be fully assured, to have a full understanding and grasp of the gospel. And why is he laboring so hard? Gain. Gain for them. And even gain for himself. His his joy is tied up with that. And his joy is tied up with being pleasing to the Lord. 
Remember, back in chapter 3 again, verses 23 and 24, where, where he talks about doing everything heartily to the Lord rather than men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive a reward. The reward of the inheritance where Christ is my portion. He will be my portion forever, my inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. It's always costly to follow the Lord in terms of something else. You, you looked earlier, we, we saw in Colossians chapter 3, where we're to put off the, the, the things of sin and, and put on the things of righteousness. When we give up the ways of the world, it's costing us. We're not finding our pleasure in those things. We're putting those off to put something else on where there is true life and peace. And are we willing to give up the, the life that finds itself in, in, in the fleeting pleasures of this life to gain eternal treasure? It's like Luke chapter 9, Jesus says, he's talking to his disciples and said, whoever desires to come after me, what must he do? Take up his cross, an instrument of death. But he desires to come after Christ. That's why he's taking it up. Whoever wishes to save his life shall lose it. His desire is to save his life. So he's going to give up the life, lose the life that finds itself here to gain the life that finds itself in him. That's what Jesus' call was. The goal in this life is to gain. And we are part of the people that God is making for himself who will inherit eternal life. And so we can spend this life participating in the gospel, actually adding to the weight of glory that we will receive in Christ. I always think of the the Jim Elliott quote. This is a missionary who, who gave his life for the sake of the gospel, slaughtered by a foreign tribe, and he went into glory, and he had this quote before that says, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Is the cost that's involved something to avoid, or is it an opportunity? Now, maybe we don't think about the mission field, but what about the cost of following Christ in our day to day relationships, difficult bosses? Stress in the home, where, where, where people close to you are against you. Now, how's the lordship of Christ work out in the midst of that? How does, how does the gospel speak and live in the midst of those situations? Am I going to fight by self-protection, anger, getting back, bitterness? Or am I going to try and point to Christ and rest on him and like, this is an opportunity. This is an opportunity for me to be more like Christ and to reflect Christ to others, that he might be exalted and I'm pleasing to the Lord. Am I going to rest in my ways of dealing with it or or Christ's ways? Am I going to be in gospel fellowship or am I going to just fight the way the world fights? And even my weakness, am I going to call out, Lord, help me. And I'm exalting him even as I'm crying out for help, as I'm failing. I'm recognizing my weakness and my dependence upon the grace of the Lord. And I can communicate that. How often do we never bring Christ in the middle of our conflicts? And even if it's just a cry for, Lord, help me, even as Peter, when he was sinking in the water, said, Lord, save me, that we can cry out and see what the Lord might do by exalting him in the midst of our trials instead of protecting ourselves. Participation in the gospel. What sacrifices might we have for the gospel to be more grasped by ourselves and grasped by others so that the effects can be seen among us? Some of you, maybe it's it's formal ministry. Maybe it's crossing the, the barriers that are in our culture. Maybe it's things like helping out in places you've never gone before. Some of you, maybe it's using your house for a Bible study or you're devoted to prayer. All of us are called to encourage one another day by day. What kind of sacrifices help us foster this unity? I had been reading a book recently called Compelling Community with Others, and it's talking about what's compelling about the gospel community is that it does transcend all these other type of affinities that we might have. 
it speaks to something larger and it encourages us and it gives us a number of things that I think are good for us to think about as we think about the, the costliness and the reward that's on the other side. And, and some of the sacrifices are, are, are simple as sacrificing some of our comfort to reach out and associate with someone we're not naturally drawn to. After the service, you see two different people you might talk to. Make sure that at least some of the time you walk up to someone you're, you're not quite as comfortable with and, and be about something that's centered on the Lord. We can sacrifice our preferences. Maybe where you sit to let a guest have a seat or, or what kind of food you eat at a fellowship dinner and, and maybe give up your whole dietary structure for a while just so you can be with them or, or the songs that you sing. Love one another with a brotherly affection and sacrifice, Paul says in Romans 12. We can sacrifice our resources, our, our time to, to serve fellow church members in need. And it might not pay the same hourly wage we get at work. It might not be worth it, but you're loving someone because of Christ and their brothers and sisters. First John 3.18, John says, it's not love in, in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. We sacrifice our, our habits to, to spend time with those we'd otherwise never see. Go to lunch with someone different than you. It might be costly. But what are we on about? And even in this life, there, there, there can be a benefit. It's not just eternal. Here, here, Paul lost his status as a Pharisee, and he probably lost a lot of his comrades through this conversion, maybe even disinherited from his family. But here in this list, what do we see? We see a new family. Don't we? Brothers. He calls brothers and sisters. It's like Jesus is teaching in Mark 10. Peter said, hey, look, Lord, we've left everything. And Jesus said, here's what I'm telling you. There's no one who's left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold In this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands, with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. We see here in this portrait, this tapestry, some of the brothers and sisters that have become part of Paul's household, the family of God's household. And if you look across the letters, we we see the faithfulness of Christ to, to this promise of this teaching. Paul mentions dozens and dozens of associates that he can call brothers and sisters in Christ. In becoming a believer, we can lose friends, but we can gain a new family and in the age to come, eternal life. Listen, ultimately, our reward comes from our master. This is an earning salvation. He's paid that cost. This is gospel fellowship. It's unity amidst diversity. It's a willingness to to share with others in this ministry. And it comes from a faith that rests in Christ. Real fellowship comes from faith. Before we can know the reality of fellowship with each other, we need to know the reality of fellowship with God the Father and Jesus Christ, his Son. We need to recognize that apart from him, we can do nothing, that we are condemned sinners. We need to accept that Christ calls people out of darkness into his light and believe that he is the only way and commit to him being the Lord of our life. And if we don't have fellowship with the Father and the Son, we can't share in the fellowship in the realities of the gospel. So if this isn't something you've grabbed onto, Christ is calling you, turn from darkness, repent of your sins, and find yourself in the Lord. And then how good it is to be part of Christ's people. And then we are part of that tapestry that God is making through the gospel to his glory. And it's good to be in the family of God. So Father, help us, help us to see the beauty of the gospel and the hope that you set before us that, that transcends even the difficulties that we see here, the dark threads that you know are useful for what you're doing. So give us hope, give us unity, and give us fellowship in the good news of Jesus Christ in whose name we pray.